good morning once again. We are back after our holiday break. Hope you guys had a great holiday break. Hope you had one that was free of bad surprises. <laughs> anyway, I'm Carrie, if you remember. I'm the teen librarian here at the library, and this is First Chapter Friday, where we bring you the first chapters of books ranging all the way from early chapter books up through young adult. I'm going to read a chapter from a young adult book today. And it's one that it came out in 2020, but it kind of been on the back of my TBR pile. And I finally got around to it. Actually, I read the audiobook version of it, which had a really good narrator. I can vouch for this audiobook on Libby. And I just binged through it in two days just because I couldn't stop listening. It's called The Bitter Wine Oath. And the basic premise is it's this town in Texas where ages ago there had been some young ladies who worked some magic that had a really negative, unexpected backlash that it brought about the deaths of 12 men. And then 50 years later, 12 more men were killed and they were suspected or they were thought maybe it was copycat because the first time around the deaths, they couldn't explain what had happened. And these deaths also, they couldn't really explain what had happened. No one was willing to, to accept that it might not have been a, a natural kind of death, <laughs> more of a supernatural kind of death. But now they're coming up on the next anniversary, the next 50th anniversary of the event. And our hero, Natalie, is actually one of the descendants of the women the first time around who had worked the magic and she thinks it's it's all just superstition and everything but well she finds out she's not quite right through the course of the book and sort of gets involved and it's it's, it's a really I would not call it like gruesome ever really but it's uh, magic and, and thriller and light horror. I enjoyed it a lot. So I'm gonna read the first, well, there's an intro and then I'll get into the first chapter. So the intro is taken from another book that the main character ends up reading a lot from the perspective of one of the other young women who 100 years ago had worked the first magic, Lillian Picard. I did not regret befriending Malachi Rivers until the night we invoked her magic to seek revenge. Four of us sat in a circle on the floor of an abandoned cabin in the piney woods, twine looped around our girlish wrists binding us together. A grimoire lay open on tender sprigs of herbs and bones of woodland creatures. Segments of text had been violently crossed out and revisions crammed into the margins. Malachi Rivers was indeed that powerful. Her edits and improvisations increased the potency of every charm, hex, curse, and conjuration. Until that fateful night in the summer of 1921, our foursome, led by Malachi, had performed harmless magic for entertainment and empowerment. Dorothy Hawkins, Johanna Mead, and I rev revered Malachi's magic and wanted to participate. While we were bound together, we could channel it. The powerless could become powerful. We called ourselves Pagans of the Pines in a spirit of cheeky rebellion. The magic had been a girlhood game to me. The grimoire, nothing more than a mass-produced curious collectible pilfered from the parlor of my cosmopolitan aunt but everything changed that night. Childish rebellion turned to sinister retribution. Dorothy, Johanna, and Malachi had endured trials I could not fathom. <clears throat> Malachi's father was controlling and oppressive. Johanna Mead's abusive father and uncle had beaten the boy she loved nearly to death out of twisted sense of protectiveness. A lynch mob had murdered Dorothy Hawkins' older brother over a false accusation that he had attempted to murder a white man. Her sharecropper father had lost his land, and the family relied on charity from their church to scrape by. Now that Malachi had nearly mastered her magic of earth, bone, and blood, the three of them wanted to claim vengeance commensurate to their suffering. We did not mean to kill. Malachi concocted a curse that would reveal the deep evil within the hearts of men who had wronged them, so that society would no longer accept, respect, or enable their dark deeds. Malachi had spoken the curse over the communion wine in the sanctuary of her father's church. We watched her, witnessed her slender body rocking with power, her wrists and hands trembling. She dusted the wine with herbs, dipped her fingers into the chalice, and painted her mark on the white cloth of the communion table, the mark we had created to represent the three elements from which she drew her power. 
The Devil's Supper, I recall her whispering in the candlelight. We returned to our sacred ground, the cabin nestled in a forgotten forest glade, to finish our work. We would use magic to lure the men to communion at the witching hour. They would drink the cursed wine, and their darkness would be known to all. But as soon as we split the flesh of our fingertips and dripped blood over our preparations, I felt Malachi's magic spinning out of control, like a toy top whirling fast enough to lift off the ground and bounce about unpredictably. The other girl's anger fueled it, giving it a will of its own. I was afraid. I wanted to stop it. But our hands were already bound, and to break the bond before our work was complete would be far more dangerous than even the darkest conjuration. I may undoubtedly have lost many a reader already with my earnest talk of magic, but I have no other pen with which to write this biography. Any tale about Malachi that excludes magic is not about Malachi at all. Excerpt from Pagans of the Pines, The Untold Story of Malachi Rivers, published 1968. 1. Natalie Coulter. Present day, one month and ten days until the claiming. The first day of my last summer in San Solano was clammier than a fever. The sun baked the mud from last night's storm like clay in a kiln as my best friend and I ran the trail we'd forged between our two houses. You're falling behind, regional champ, Lindsay Valenzuela taunted over her shoulder. Ambition gnawed at my tired muscles, and I pushed myself harder. In a few short months, I'd be a college freshman distance runner with everything to prove. Couldn't afford a lethargic summer. My toe caught on a divot in the rough terrain and I fell, earning stinging scrapes along my palms and elbows. Lindsay doubled back to offer me a hand, her shadow stretching over me. You okay? I accepted the help and unstuck my sweaty tank top from my skin. No offense, but when did you get faster than me? It's my green juice. She slapped her bicep, way too perky for having just covered three miles in the heat. You should try it. No way, it smells like toxic waste. Your call. Lindsay swiped caramel, highlighted dark hairs from her dewy face and grinned. I'll just keep handing you your ass. As I brushed dirt off my legs, a lazy wind carried perfume from clusters of pale honeysuckles, and with it, a stench of rot. I wrinkled my nose and palmed sweat from my eyes, searching the overgrown grasses. Behind a barbed wire fence marking private pasture land, I found a bovine rib cage the size of a barrel. Scavengers had ripped away most of the meat, but flaps of decaying flesh remained. Gross, Lindsay said, following my look of disgust. Like every other East Texas town, San Solano was hotter than Devil's Crack by the end of May, and the carcass reeked. But I ventured to step into the chigger-ridden grasses to get a closer look. Nat, don't get too close, Lindsay said. <clears throat> There's no head. I was almost relieved by the lack of a bulging tongue and hollow eye sockets. Isn't that weird? It's probably mounted in a steakhouse. That's an Angus farm, I said, pointing. Why would anyone mount a cow with no horns? I expected to see my curiosity mirrored in her molasses brown eyes. But she shrugged and flicked a mosquito from her patterned neon running shorts. You're the one whose dad's a vet. I don't know anything about cows. She caught up to my insinuation and flashed me a sideways look of suspicion. You better not be getting superstitious on me. Retying my dirty blonde hair in a ponytail, I crossed back through the patches of Indian paintbrush. I'm not saying I think the Malachians are still around or anything. Good. But don't you think it's a little unsettling? It's just a dead cow, Lindsay cried. This town is on the verge of hysteria. An overstatement, but San Solano was undeniably on edge. The sheriff's department had sent deputies to our classes the week before finals to, look, to hook their thumbs in their belts and lecture us about getting too rowdy this summer. Stay away from Calvary Baptist unless you're attending a service, they'd warned. And don't stir up trouble at the cabin in the woods. No trespassing means no trespassing. They asked us to inform them of anything unusual. We knew what they meant. Books of curses, assortments of herbs and animal bones, or the symbol that had become shorthand for cult activity in San Solano. But they warned us not to panic if we saw something suspicious. The most likely culprits would be local teens like us pulling pranks, or tourists who were overly fascinated with the town's violent past. Plenty of their kind would descend on San Solano in the coming days. Maybe the police would succeed in discouraging the late night dares and the rumors threatening to whip the town into a frenzy, but nothing would stop the curious gazes that burned the back of my neck. Nothing would stop the calls from journalists that made our mom unplug our outdated landline and forced my dad to add veterinary business only to his contact page. As the only living descendants of Malachi Rivers, we were the hot ticket in town this summer. The twins want to meet us at the sawmill, Lindsay said, checking her phone. Can we detour? I'm hungry. I glanced back at the headless carcass, wondering how Lindsay could summon an appetite right now, but I decided to drop it. I could picture the sheriff teasing me for calling to report dead livestock in a pasture. He'd been my dad's best friend since their middle school days. We hit the trail again. I couldn't shake the sense that Lindsay was pacing herself to avoid leaving me in the dust. A healthy sense of competition had been the foundation of our friendship ever since we'd borrowed our teacher's stopwatch to race across the monkey bars during third grade recess. I wanted to snap at her for going easy on me, 
I was too fast for her to go easy on me. She was barely panting by the time we stepped off the trail into an overgrown meadow and crossed the country highway to Sawmill, our town's famously ramshackled barbecue joint. The Dixon twins waited for us at a picnic table outside. The hot metal bench burned my bare thighs as I plopped down next to Abby with my sweet tea and pulled pork sandwich. She smelled like freshly applied sunscreen, but her round ivory face seemed to only get pinker as the sun bore down on us. Y'all want to do a group trip to Toledo Bend after church this Sunday? Her sister Faith asked, bending the brim of her ball cap to shade her equally sensitive face. Her button nose was still peeling from the last sunburn. Will you do be, or will you be too busy training like overachieving dorks? Y'all are begging to get massacred out on those trails, Abby added before either of us could answer. Technically, that would be murder, not massacre, I pointed out. And we're not boys, so we're safe, which is pretty ironic. Come on, people, Lindsay smacked her palm into the table, rattling the condiments. No one could ever prove that Malachi and her friends killed those dudes, and even the copycat murderers would be old now if they're still alive. Nothing's going to happen. She was right about the first two things, and probably right about the third. Malachi Rivers and three other girls had faced trial for fatally poisoning a dozen men, including Malachi's father, with communion wine in a church sanctuary in July of 1921. The motive was there, but the conclusive evidence was not. Though the men had clearly partaken of the wine just before they died, the police found that it didn't contain any identifiable toxic substances. The girls were acquitted. Malachi had been the leader of the group, and thus the unanswered questions had circled back to her. She had tried to make a normal life for herself after the trial, but she disappeared permanently just a handful of years later, leaving a husband and young son, my great-grandfather, without a word. And then a second massacre happened exactly 50 years after the first. The 12 victims were, once again, all male. Unlike the first time, they were mostly young, in their teens and 20s, and hadn't committed any heinous offenses, as far as anyone knew. And unlike the first time, there was evidence of a struggle in the sanctuary, bruises and lacerations on the victims' wrists suggesting they'd been held against their will, several broken bones between them, plus destruction of church property. The actual cause of their deaths was still unknown. Forensic testing proved beyond a doubt that the wine contained nothing but harmless herbs. The cases were more like kissing cousins than identical twins. Due, the, due to the discrepancies, investigators labeled the second massacre a copycat crime. And even though Malachi had been declared legally innocent, it was clear that the copycats had been inspired by rumors of the magic. Thus, the investigators lumped the events together and dubbed them the Malachian Massacres. Both remained unsolved. And now, the semi-centennial anniversary of the massacres was creeping closer. The town's unspoken questions had been like keepsakes tucked away in the attic. Did Malachi and her three friends have something to do with the deaths of the men who traumatized them in 1921? Who had mimicked the massacre in 1971? And most importantly, were the fanatics out there today? Would the people who revered Malachi's legacy strike again? As if reading my thoughts, Abby spoke up in a voice that would have paired well with a flashlight and a campfire. Maybe the Malachians have been recruiting in secret this whole time. Maybe someone we know was one of them. It's kind of interesting to imagine. Interesting? Lindsay cut her off, instantly serious. Real people died, Abby. I know that, Lindsay, Abby retorted. She rolled her blue eyes and jabbed at her potato salad. Our great great uncle died in the first massacre. He was a jerk and he deserved it, but it's not a joke to me. The glare in Lindsay's chocolate brown eyes melted away. Anyway, Nat would know if the Malachians were still active. How would I know? I asked, devouring a bite of my messy sandwich. I'd always been interested in massacres from a historical standpoint, but I wasn't obsessed or anything. Because they would try to recruit you, Lindsay explained, as though it were obvious. They believe Malachi Rivers could do magic, and you're related to her. Has anyone ever tried to drag you out to the woods for a creepy ritual or anything? No? Then the cult is dead, Lindsay declared. She arched her dark brows at Abby and slurped the last of her Dr. Pepper. All the more reason to have some fun, Abby said. We know we're not in any real danger. Faith had been studying her split ends, but she flicked her ash-brown braid over her shoulder and planted her elbows on the table. Everyone's talked this topic to death. Are y'all in for the lake trip with the usual crew? And Levi, Abby added. He's back in town. I had already spotted the weathered blue pickup in the Langford family's driveway, but hearing his name made a pang pinch between my ribs. Lindsay eyed me sidelong as I spilled my tea and crushed ice between my teeth. Only she knew what had happened between Levi and me before he left last August. He'd been slated to start his freshman year at college in Dallas when his father had died suddenly of an aneurysm. Levi's mom and sister had hoped he would defer for a semester, but he didn't, he left. And since finding his letter in my mailbox on the morning he'd driven away, I hadn't heard from him once. The letter had been a stoic farewell, its careful words the cool cobalt of distance and forgetting. Did you hear Le Levi got two of his poems published in like a prestigious poetry review? Faith asked. Mrs. Langford was bragging on him at the potluck last Sunday. Good for him, Lindsay chirped, saving me from having to reply. So are y'all coming? Faith pressed. Lindsay fiddled with a fitness watch that left subtle tan lines on her golden brown wrist, waiting for me to say yes before she accepted the invitation. 
I could tell Levi's homecoming had already raised her hackles, but she didn't need to worry about me wasting any energy on him. Yeah, sounds fun, I said. I only had one summer to soak up time with the people I'd miss, people who'd miss me back. The twins drove me home first, past acres upon acres of pines and meadows. When we jostled over the gravel driveway toward my family's yellow farmhouse and the guest house my dad had converted into a veterinary office, Maverick and Ranger, our catalogs, scrambled from the front porch to greet me. See you at graduation, Abby sang out the window. I waved and scratched the dog's mottled gray and black coats before checking the mail, finding graduation cards from relatives and a hefty packet of summer training and nutrition tips for my future coach. But when I shut the squealing mailbox, I noticed something odd up at the base of the nearest fence post. A smooth stone with neat engraving. I bent to scoop it up. My mouth went dry as I traced my thumb over each familiar component of the design. A triangle pointing down with a horizontal line through the bottom third. Earth. Two diagonal lines crossing through the triangle. Bone. A smear of dried dark red at the center. Blood. It was the Malachian mark. It's chapter one, The Bitter Wine Oath by Hannah West. You can pick up the book here. You can get the audiobook off Libby like I did. I highly recommend it.